The, the biggest tip for like parents with toddlers is they'll want to get involved and they'll be curious about absolutely everything and food for me was one of the biggest. And I was like, that, this is not right, you know, that the, the advice that this, you know, sick woman at 10 weeks pregnant should be, you know, stuffing kale smoothies down her throat, otherwise you're going to be a bad mum, is, is just wrong. The term food before one is just for fun, I don't know if you've come across that, which it definitely is fun and it's really important to um, have some fun with it, but... One shouted at me to get back in the kitchen and I was like, that is equality, brilliant. And we're rolling. So today I'm joined by Adam Shaw, founder of At The Dad's Table and author of How To Grow Your Family. Thanks for joining me today, Adam. Thanks, Tom. Good to be here. It's really important, important and encouraging to have a dad be so positive about food when it comes to raising your family. I think obviously you're encouraging other dads and all parents and caregivers to get involved with cooking with their family and it, I found it's quite rare to see someone very passionate about um, weaning and the importance of food and their kids so we, we want to try and unpick some of that today if that's okay. Just to kick off with all guests I like to just just to provide a bit of context with your transition into parenting life J just want to try and start at the beginning so are you able to take me back to your life before kids sort of where were you in your life and when you and your partner sort of decided like yes we're ready to start a family. Sure. So, um, so I've now got three boys, um, age five, three, and ten months old. Um, so going back, f yeah, uh, going back five, six years. So, me and my wife, um, who's German, we, we lived all over the world. We travelled. Um, I had a corporate job in London, um, and, and we really enjoyed kind of our, our twenties and, and mid thirties. You know, living a bit of the high life. Um, and then we thought it's it's time to settle down. We moved back to the UK. Um, and wanted to have children and didn't really want to do it in London so we moved to the countryside um, so I'm in Kent just outside London um, and, and I think we, we kind of felt I always remember a phrase I heard I think in, in my 20s which was you know you know you're ready to have kids when kind of you, you kind of you've got enough for yourself you know you don't need to buy yourself stuff all the time or, or you, you know you're not selfish enough and and I think we both kind of got to that point where we're like, you know, let's, you know, we, we've ticked off the boxes we wanted to achieve. Um, we know people that have struggled to conceive and, and, and so on. So let's just try and, and, and see what happens. Um, and luckily enough, we, we, we didn't have any problems. Um, but kind of where At Dad's Table came from was um, the last thing I wanted to achieve as, um, as, a, as a person before having children um, was to become a qualified chef. Um, so I studied at um, Leith's, which is a, a school in London, and they had this night school where you could, you know, after your, your full-time job, you could go and, and learn how to be a chef. And I thought, I'm going to do this before I, I have a family and I have to be around more. So I did it, and it was one of the best experiences of my life. And then as I finished it, my wife became pregnant for the first time. So I was like, great, I've come out of chef school. I've got all these brilliant, you know, tricks and techniques and fun foods to make to make sure you have a really good pregnancy and, and everything. And then I went kind of and looked at the official advice about what you should be eating during pregnancy. And it was just so negative. You know, it was just, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't eat shark, you know, sit in a corner and eat some vegetables. And I just thought, this, this, this isn't right. And also selfishly speaking, I'm, I'm eating the same food as well. I don't really wanna be doing this. Um, so I just delved into the science a little bit behind what it is. And a lot of it is just, you know, there's been no research into this, or we don't, or 50 years ago the study said you shouldn't do this. So I just started kind of creating my own positive food for her. Um, and it kind of went from there, um, which is, I guess, a really, really long-winded answer to your question. So your decision to train as a chef, was that sort of um, to explore a hobby, or was that with a view to change careers? Um, it was a bit of both. It, it was not okay. wanting to work, work in a kitchen, but trying to find what else could I do with a, a professional qualification when I'm not massively satisfied in, in my corporate life. You, you make a good point about the negativity around what you can eat. I, I remember every time my wife's been pregnant, it's always been a little bit um, troubling going to a restaurant because we spend about half an hour reviewing the menu, uh, Googling everything, what she can eat, what she can't eat. And it's, all, it's quite a negative experience. So it's really good that you identified that and. It, it, you're trying to put a positive spin um, in terms of telling uh, expecting mothers what they can eat. I, I just think it, it's it's a very vulnerable time for, for both of you 
um, and, I, and it really um, came home to me, you know, obviously in, in, you know, the first trimester when you're feeling awful, you don't really want to be eating vegetables and, and sometimes you beat yourself up about, you know, trying to eat healthy or whatever. And I distinctly remember one day I came home and my wife was maybe, you know, nine, ten weeks pregnant, feeling awful. And she just burst into tears as soon as I walked through the door. And I was like, why are you crying? She's going, oh, I, I went to Pizza Express today and I had a garlic bread and a pizza for lunch. So basically two pizzas. I'm really, really jealous. Um, but she was like, I'm going to have a stupid baby. I didn't eat any vegetables. And I was like, that, this is not right. You know, that the, the advice that this, you know, sick woman at 10 weeks pregnant should be, you know, stuffing kale smoothies down her throat. Otherwise, you're going to be a bad mum is, is just wrong. And, and I don't know how you find this, but the kind of this, this pressure about right and wrong, it starts with day one in pregnancy. And as parents now, yeah. it's still going on. You know, it's still, are you doing the right things? Are you even doing the wrong things? Those, even though struggling to conceive, obviously, when if you've been trying for a year and you, you're not pregnant, you explore every avenue. And one of the things you fall onto is food. You know, what am I doing wrong? Do I need to eat these foods? Will eat, will certain foods help us conceive? So I think, yeah, it starts even from when you make the decision that you want to start a family, really. And, and, then, and then I found kind of when, when she was you know, going through this process, I was like, you know, I, I feel quite useless um, whilst you're pregnant. I don't really know. Yes, I'll go to the, the, the scans and, and everything and I'll pack the bags, yeah. but there's not much I can do. So I thought, right, if I take ownership of the food and start, you know, doing stuff that, that makes her feel good, that's a way to help me be involved. And I found, you know, from a mental health perspective, um, taking on that role of, of, you know, provider in the family is, is good for me. And it's good yeah. for me since, you know, since I've had children as well. And I guess that allowed you to feel more connected to the pregnancy as well absolutely absolutely yeah yeah and, and so one of the things i talk about now is that if you know if dads don't really know what to do it's you know pick pick the food you know and, and just you know run with it and, and take care of that and it is nice to see that and obviously we'll get into that shortly that, that that rolled over then into actual life as a dad and you've you've carried on that healthy relationship with food right through with your kids um but before we before we get to that, in terms of one thing I talk to new parents about a lot is that initial transition into parenting life. So you've got three boys now, you're a seasoned professional. Going back to when you brought your first home, uh, to take a quote from your book, you describe it as uh, like the transition as being hit in the face of the sledgehammer. <laughs> So what did those early weeks look like for you? Did you take paternity leave for a prolonged period of time? Were you juggling work and home life? How did that look and how did you cope with that? So I, I guess we define everything now with, with pre and post COVID. So this was, this was pre COVID. This was me still commuting an hour each morning and afternoon to London. Um, had the most wonderful two weeks paternity leave where it's, it's like a holiday, right? You're at home and you're bonding with baby. And then, what we found difficult was I was out of the house for, you know, 12 hours a day. She was on her own with our first, um, who was, you know, he was, he was quite an easy baby, but it was still, you know, a sledgehammer trying yeah. to cook for yourself, trying to make three meals a day, trying to catch up on sleep, trying to do everything. Um, and then I, I quickly realized that if I got home from work at seven, you know, I'd try and, you know, take baby by maybe nine o'clock so that my wife could go to bed early and have a few hours. So suddenly you've got this two hour period where you both need to eat, you both need to cook, you both need to clean the house, you both need to shower, you know, and and it's like you have twice as much to do, but half as much time to do it in. And it was just this kind of sprint from seven o'clock until nine o'clock. And then, you know, watch box sets with a baby asleep on your chest, which was, I, I found the best thing about being a new parent is the amount of TV you can watch. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so, yeah, it, it was just a real shock, really, for, for both of us. Yeah, I don't think there's anything that can prepare you. T to be fair, so we've got a uh, 12-week-old now, um, and we've also got an almost 5-year-old, and we're finding the transition from 1 to 2 has been a lot tougher than the transition from 0 to 1. Transition from 0 to 1 was really tough because, you, you, like you say, you're hitting the face with a sledgehammer, you're letting go of your old life, there's a lot of emotions, but 1 to 2 juggling the emotions of our four and a half year old at the time and trying to give the baby attention and then feeling the pressure to let people in to see the baby and getting the baby out. I, how did you find that in terms of 
what was the hardest transition zero to one one to two or in your case two to three i think def definitely one to two um so as i said our, our first you know was you know he, he was a baby it was tough but there was it was relatively straightforward our second was born three weeks before the first lockdown um, and he had colic so we had the first lockdown with a colicky baby and a three-year-old that couldn't go to nursery and it was just this pressure cooker which i think now that we're out of it we're all we're, we're all a bit scarred from it and at the time we didn't realize what pressure it was um and i think the emotions you feel going from one to two i mean correct me if i'm wrong but it, it's a certain amount of guilt about not spending enough time with your first it's thinking you know how is this all going to work when you go from two to three, because you've kind of been through that process, you still have those emotions, but you kind of know, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully we'll get through it and my kids won't be too screwed up. Yeah, that's good to know. I, I'd say my wife and I have talked about it. We feel like the doors shut on, on having a third because my wife's been pregnant seven times and we've had quite a challenging journey. I wouldn't say the door's locked, so we might explore it at some point, but yeah, if, it feels like we, we're just thankful we've got two healthy little ones, but that's interesting that you said, even though you've got three that the transition from one to two was the most challenging. Yeah, I mean, I, I still think, I mean, for example, I, I, I sat down with my 10 month old last night to read him a book and he literally looked at me as in, what are you doing? You know, my first, you, know, you read a book every day. The third one is like, what is this piece of paper that you're holding in front of me? So I, I think, not to be glib about it, I, I think you, you realize as you go further on that, you know, there is stuff that you can't do um, but you, you're there for the important stuff. Yeah, yeah, we're finding that. So again, with our first, my wife and I were both all in. He, he got 100% of our undivided attention. We tried to do everything right. And it feels like with Mia, she's 12 weeks now, she's not along for the ride, but she sort of needs to adjust because we're already established parents. We've got all of our routines. We've got the needs of our five-year-old, almost five-year-old to take care of. So yeah, it feels like she's just sort of ha has to come along for a lot of things. So um, I think one thing I'm finding that's really useful is just identifying when an opportunity arises to just take her away into another room for even like half an hour and just get a bit of quality one-on-one -on -one time with her. That helps with the bonding and things like that. So that's quite a good tip. I, I think if, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, any advice or, or whatever, I think, you know, obviously when, when you have one child at home, you do naturally build in breaks for yourself during the day. I think when you have two or two or more, it's a conscious decision to think, I need to spend that one-on-one -on -one time with my child and maybe lose less of my break and less of my day for myself, knowing that, you know, I'll get it, you know, going for a morning run or, or having the evening or whatever. But I think that's the conscious decision that, you know, if, if one of you is busy with one and there's another child, then you've got to, you know, get down on the floor and, and get busy with that one too. Okay, so um, if we talk about food for a moment, so one thing I read a, a lot of on social media and in particular Instagram is the the term food before one is just for fun. I don't know if you've come across that, which it definitely is fun and it's really important to um, have some fun with it. But from about six months, our little ones need a lot more iron because their iron reserves are reduced so we need to start introducing foods high in iron and then you obviously to help with the absorption we need to introduce vitamin c so fruit and vegetables so that there, there's definitely more than just it being fun i think parents sh shouldn't assume they'll get everything from their formula or the breast milk i don't know if you've got any views on that yeah so so as as baby goes from six months to a year what they take from formula and breast milk decreases and it needs to be supplemented with other stuff. So I, I think the food before one, it, it's, it's a nice phrase, and I think it's important to remember in case weaning isn't going well for you, or in case you're very stressed about it, or in case you're finding it incredibly challenging and difficult. But if, if you're not, or if it's something that you're enjoying or something you can dedicate the time to, then pick it up and run with it. Um, because giving baby exposure to different tastes, to different textures, to you know, meal times with the family around the table is, is absolutely invaluable. Um, so ours, sorry, our, our third is 10 months and he's just gone into nursery now. Um, so he's still got, you know, another two months until he's one, but he very much needs food during the day on top of his milk, just because he's, he's in a new environment. He's exercising all day long. He's starting to walk. He's burning off those calories. So again, I wouldn't worry about it, but it's not a reason to, you know, 
you not give any food or, or for example when you um go down the the, the solids route so you introduce fruit and vegetables for your child to sort of interact with that then helps with the motor skills and the sensory skills so, so it's a lot more than just the food as well isn't it absolutely so so i mean a, a six-month-old baby doesn't sit there and go oh i'm really hungry i i feel like some pasta <laughs> you know it's you they're put in a new um then you put in a new environment and everything for them is sensory everything for them is experimenting and playing so if you are you know, lucky enough that, that one of you is at home with, with, with a weaning child, giving them that time and space and confidence just to explore and, you know, rub yogurt all over their face if that's what they want to do or, you know, rip apart pieces of pasta is absolutely invaluable because, yes, you're developing the pincer grip and everything you need to eat, but you're just exposing them again and again and again to different textures, different tastes, different smells. You know, my my, my kids, I used, to, I used to love it, but sometimes I get my kids involved with you know, either cooking or just being around with me, and I can smell like onion and garlic on their fingers as they go to bed, and I just love it because I know that they're yeah, getting yeah. all of that exposure. And, and the mess is something parents just need to embrace, don't they? You just need to be prepared for it because it is fun. I know a lot of parents you know, can't stand mess, but if you're prepared for it, having a dog helps because he just um, sits under the table and, <laughs> and clears up everything. But I know... I see that as a positive. A lot of parents I know get uncomfortable because they, if they've got a pouch, for example, of food, they they can monitor how much the child is eating. Yeah, I, I think that's when the phrase "food before one" is just for fun comes in when you're worried about, yeah. you know, how, how much grams of protein have they had this week or whatever. And, and again, you know, seeing what they eat over a week as opposed to, you know, today Georgie didn't have any yogurt. Oh no, he hasn't got enough calcium. You know, it's it's a week. If you can see it like that, that helps. Um, and with the mess, yes, be comfortable with it. If you're not comfortable with it, then maybe limit the amount of foods you know will make a mess. You know, I think yeah. we've all been there where, you know, you give them a spaghetti bolognese and then they completely ruin the top that they have underneath, right? So maybe do that once a week. Don't do that every time. Um, the, the worst thing you could do is clean as you go. So if, because then that kind of gives them the impression that, oh, what I'm doing is wrong. So embrace the mess, clean it up after. If you're not comfortable with the mess, then just think about the stuff that you're actually serving to limit that mess, is what I'd say. One thing that we got through a lot of when uh, Luca was uh, weaning was shower curtains. So super cheap, obviously wipeable, and you can lay them on the floor if you're worried about the mess. Just collects everything, so that's a... <laughs> that's a brilliant so. idea that's a, that's, a, that's a brilliant hack i never thought of that i think for us it was um just get a stick hoover so you can just not oh, even yeah, think about yeah. it and just you know whiz it up or, or a dog as you say yeah well one thing that i really love looking at on your instagram and it reminds me of a lot certainly when luca was a toddler so maybe from 14 months to four years old when they just want to be with you all the time and they want to get involved in anything you're doing is trying to reframe cooking because it can be quite stressful if you're trying to cook and the child is like at your feet which i've seen a lot of on your instagram your children are always around um whereas if you try and involve them but adjust your expectations that the meal might not go to plan <laughs> um it, it really does open the door from turning a stressful situation into an enjoyable experience yeah so um you know we, we've got you know little step ladders that you know our, our kids stand on to help what we do it, it, it's just become part of the furniture so you know when the kids come in in the breakfast uh, for breakfast they'll just kind of walk up the little step ladder have a little look around maybe sit on the counter um i'm not getting them involved in heavy duty cooking but they're just used to me being around food and food and, and then being around and you know my my toddler might pick up a clove of garlic and just put it in his mouth and have a bite of it and obviously he'll not like it and put it back in the bowl and I'll have to throw it away but um yeah just, just having them around having I think we, we've never been a kind of family where you know I'll shut them off in the lounge so they watch tv whilst I make food our house mm. isn't big enough for that anyway and, and I like having them around anyway so I, I think all of that stuff it just subtly goes in that you know um and also the, the fact that the guy is making it is quite nice. I, I, I never forget my, um, my eldest when he was, you know, first discovering, you know, freedom of choice and temper and everything. He once shouted at me to get back in the kitchen. And I was like, <laughs> that is equality. Brilliant. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, it is. It, it's healthy to see our little ones see us doing those sort of things. Um, 
but yeah i think the the biggest tip for like parents with toddlers is they'll want to get involved and they'll be curious about absolutely everything and food for me was one of the biggest ones for Luca. he just wanted to be in the kitchen so you can every night you can have that battle you could the power struggle trying to move him away or just try and come up with creative ways to get him involved and it was the same with the recycling he loved it when i put the bins out <laughs> he loved when we were gardening so you know it's not quite soft play but <laughs> it's actually um you know they pick up a lot from those what we see as just day-to-day -day tasks but just getting him involved with those yeah absolutely and um you can't quite see over my shoulder but if you can see I've, I've just got you know bowls of fruit bowls of onions bowls of garlic around if your kid wants to help and you really can't be bothered because you're cooking something or you know there's some raw chicken there that you don't want them to touch just give them an onion you know and they'll metaphorically and physically peel all the different layers away or all that sort of stuff so having those sort of props around um and that there's you know there's utensils that children from every age can start to use um so start to giving those you know we i think we, we fill our kids christmas stockings with like tongs and and chopsticks and, and stuff like that okay. Okay. and they love that sort of ownership um so yeah there's lots of different ways you can get them involved and then um, a little tradition what we have is, is you know, I, I make a lot of my own um, pesto and every Saturday af um, afternoon, everyone in the morning has sports classes on a Saturday morning. So it's a tradition that we always just have a big bowl of pesto pasta um, for Saturday lunch to, to really, you know, everyone's starving. And all the boys have their own different tongs. So I just make a big bowl, put it in the middle of the table and they both come along and they make their own little portions. Um, and, and it's that ownership and, and giving them stuff that's theirs that isn't necessarily a toy that they really start to appreciate. And have you got any tips for parents around encouraging their children to have healthy relationships or a healthy relationship with food? Because I know a lot of parents struggle. I think all kids go through phases of, you know, I don't want to call it fussiness, but preference. Um, so have you got any tips for parents around fostering that healthy relationship with food as they grow? it's a real passion of mine um, and, and that there's a lot of you know fussy eating phrases bands out the internet and a lot of I'll, I'll cure your children of, of their fussy eating rubbish um, and, and it's it's a real bugbear I have um, and something I really try and do and I, I've done in my own personal life is is to in, instead of saying the word my kid is a fussy eater try and think my kid is not a confident eater and, and that sort of change in mindset for the parent I, I found really really helps um, and, and the analogy I use is um, let, let, let's take your, your eldest you know does um, does he have any sports classes does, does he go to anything yes he does taekwondo okay so let's say after weeks and weeks of going to taekwondo you suddenly take him to a rugby class all right no preparation you just turn up and you push him into a rugby class and he doesn't take to it immediately do you take him home and shout at him? Do you never go to the class again? Do you say what a waste of time it is and get angry? Or do you think my job as a parent is to give my kid confidence to enjoy that rugby class? And it is exactly the same with food. So, you know, if, if there's something that they don't like, I build up to it. I surround it with other food that they do like. I take the pressure out of it. I, I might think they might help me choose something they might help me prepare it. it it's not just an isolated right sit down here's an aubergine you know of course who's going to do that but you know if you you know go to the supermarket and say right here is the vegetable aisle pick one thing and i'm going to put it in our dinner tonight um if you get them on the counter and say here is your own knife this is how you chop if you see them see it swept down if you put it next to their favorite dish they're much more likely to have that positive relationship with food um and also there's um there's food that you just don't like right my my eldest hates potatoes absolutely hates potatoes my wife is german this is a crime for her because she was basically brought up on potatoes but after years and years of trying we've just acknowledged the fact you don't like potatoes i'm not going to give you potatoes on the flip side i spent years trying to get my kid to like eggs and i thought you know he's he's only young so I'm going to hard boil the eggs. I'm going to make scrambled eggs really kind of spongy and, and everything and cook them really, really well. Didn't like it. One day I woke up and thought, you know what? I don't like this kind of food either. Here's a soft boiled egg. Here's some runny scrambled egg. Laps it up, has eggs three times a week. 
So I, I think sometimes just taking a step back and thinking, what do I like? What, what and how can I build their confidence really, really helps change that mindset. Yeah, you made a good point there about just providing them with an item or a meal of food, sitting it, sitting them down and just saying, right, that's your meal, eat it. Whereas if you take a step back and actually just involve them in the overall process, like take them shopping, bring them into the kitchen, just get them a little bit more hands on. It, it makes them feel a little bit more empowered that they're actually um, maybe eating something that they created, although they didn't create it, but we're, we're involved with. Um, I think that's really important. I, I think the, um, the, the emotions are important as well. So I, I've spoken a lot about my eldest and my eldest is, you know, some people would describe him as a fussy eater. I say he has no confidence in, in, in food. And he also finds sitting at a table a waste of time because he would much rather be doing 400 other things. And, and that's the challenge we've had with him. So, we, you know, we devise something where, you know, I, I call it the list where I'll make something. And if he likes it, I'll say, oh, should we put it on the list? And he goes, yeah, let's put it on the list. And we've made this menu of 50, 60 dishes that I know he will eat. And, you know, every week I'll sit down and say, pick three things from the list and, and, and we'll cook that. But as a flip side my second child and, and you quite often have this when one is eating like this the other one is completely the opposite he eats everything you know and, and i was very much aware as he was growing up people were like oh he's a really good eater and i was like ah this is just as dangerous as saying someone is a fussy eater because you know yeah. maybe maybe my, my middle child will take comfort in food maybe he will be obese maybe he will have eating disorders who knows so i think taking the, the, the emotions away and saying, for a start, fussy eating, I think, is negative, and there's nothing else that we describe our kids as being bad at, instead of maybe eating and maybe sleeping. You know, why, why would I call my kid a fussy eater? He's not. And, but I also, I think praising too much also goes the other way. So taking that emotion away from the food, I think, is quite important. Yeah, that's interesting you say that, because it's just triggered something. So growing up, so my dad's Italian, and on the Italian side of the family, I played a lot of sport growing up and I loved food um, and I was always given like a huge pat on the back and called brilliant and amazing because I'd go to my grandparents and I'd eat everything they throw my way whereas my brother on the other hand didn't and yeah just thinking now how that maybe made him feel growing up constantly me getting the praise because I was great because I ate the food that was put in front of me it's quite it's an interesting way of looking at it yeah. But also, that, um, you know, without going too much deeper, maybe you always felt pressure to eat that food. Maybe you didn't want to eat that food some yeah. of the time. So I, I think when we talk about having a, a, a positive relationship with food, it's also not praising too much when someone is, is, you know, eating a lot. So in terms of your book then, what was the creative process in terms of what was the motivator that you thought, right, I'm going to take all of, you know, you're a, you become a trained chef, clearly very passionate about food. What why was it a book that you thought was needed um, and how did you go about that? I, I think it was, it's the education piece. So, so you mentioned, you know, when, when um, your wife was pregnant, Googling the, you know, the menu and making sure you have the right ingredients. I, I would, when I started just, just posting online some of the recipes I was making, um, the amount of questions I would get and the amount of, you know, people that were like, oh, there's cucumber in it. Can I eat cucumber when I'm pregnant? And, and just the, the amount of, I think, paranoia that, that there is around certain foods. So I, I wanted to, you know, the tagline of the book is more of what you, you can have, less of what you can't. And it's like, here's the six, ten foods you definitely can't eat when you're pregnant. Let's ring fence them and throw them away. Here is everything else you can eat. And as your body changes through different trimesters, here are the different things you can eat. But also, if you're feeling rubbish and just want to eat carbs, 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 here are some recipes that are just full of carbs. So I, I think it was a, a book that, you know, my, my, my wife always says the one that she wanted throughout her pregnancy, which took everything positive about the experience. Um, and then kind of it, it then leads into weaning and family food and taking that same approach about, you know, embracing the mess, embracing the positivity, embracing, you know, your kids making a mess or they might only try a few things. Um, and I just put it together um, during the first lockdown, um, sent it out to a few um, publishers and, and got um, some positive results back from it and it came out um, about a year ago. One thing I see is the, like you said there about the questions around food, like there's certain accounts that have just blown up with millions of followers. So like I think 
of all the parenting questions, where is it's behaviour or relating to food, I think food is always up there with one of the struggles. Um, and obviously you talked a little bit there about what to eat during pregnancy, but even when it comes to weaning, you know, there's a, some huge accounts out there where parents just continually need help when it comes to how can I feed them? I think parents just need all the information when it comes to what to feed them and how to feed them. Do you think maybe an uh, an exclusive weaning book could be something you've got in the pipeline in the future? De de definitely. I, I think one thing I noticed with, with our first was that, you know, we're just about getting out of the fog of the fourth trimester, which I guess is, is where you are now. And then all of a sudden weaning comes along and you've got like all of this theory that you have to do and all of this prep and you're exhausted, right? So I think something that kind of cuts through that and says, look, we, we realise how exhausting it is having children in, in the, this modern world. You don't need to be, you know, spending every evening for two weeks making purees every evening, you know. So I, I think something that acknowledges, you know, you know, weaning in the modern world is, is definitely something that's called for. Yeah, I think um, we got quite overwhelmed. Um, so we ended up buying a slow cooker and that was probably the best thing that we bought just because obviously it takes a lot of the thought out of it. You know, everything goes in the slow cooker. You know, it's nice and soft, um, generally quite healthy because you, you can make a call of, as to what you put in it. So, yeah, that was a, a good purchase for us. But obviously it could be seen as cheating. <laughs> There's so many products out there. And I don't, I've never bought one of those, you know, all-in-one baby steamer blender things. I just use a hand blender. You know, you don't need any of that right. stuff. But again, the stage we're at, which I guess is kind of gets to the heart of what I'm doing as well, we're all vulnerable. We all don't really know what we're doing. And, and I think it's important sometimes to take a step back and go, I'm an intelligent, functional adult. I don't need to buy this device when I already have this device that I've been using for 10 years in my cupboard, you know, or I don't need to completely outsource all knowledge when it comes to weaning when I understand you know how to put together a dish or, or something like that. Um, so have you got any uh, weaning tips for parents in terms of so that their, their little one maybe is around six months old when, when do we know our little one is ready for weaning? So there, there's a couple of things to look for when um, when they start to be aware of you eating so, you know, the first few months of the baby's life, you can be eating, you know, the most decadent food in front of them and they will not register it at all. Um, when they're able to sit up, that, that's kind of the main NHS guidelines as well, when you can just leave them on their own and they're actually able to sit up. Um, and when they are starting to, to put things in their mouth. So those are the kind of the three signs that the baby's ready. Um, and it's important that if, if you then do start weaning and you're finding baby is just pushing out all the food continually, then stop because baby isn't ready. So I think with, with, with our, sometimes people feel quite competitive and think, well, I can start weaning at four months. Yes, you can if your baby is ready, but more often than not, it's best just to wait until six months and then baby is probably ready. ready. Yeah, because I've seen quite a few heartbreaking posts online of, of parents that have sort of been encouraged, whether it's from um, someone on social media or an NHS um, medical professional that actually weaning earlier will help their child for sleep for longer. I, d I don't think there's any science behind it, but that is, c can borderline on quite dangerous, can't it? Yeah. And, and I think with our first child, I think we probably all got caught up in the whole competitive, list. and I think we maybe started at five months, but with my, my second and my third, we started at six months on the dot, because we were like, we don't need to rush this. Uh, he's, he's not ready. I think we we did a few tests of, you know, putting him down, he would just fall straight over on his face. We're like, okay, you're not ready. Um, one thing I did want to ask, do you have a standout recipe from your book? Which one you'd recommend? I, I think w when we're, we're talking about, you know, what would I recommend to someone who is just starting weaning or, or whatever, you know, before going into this, you know, I was never, you know, a scone or a muffin maker or all that sort of stuff. But the amount of scones and muffins you end up making when you have small kids and the amount of vegetables that you can just pack into them is is such a winner so i i love um and, and any advice to, to anyone starting on the weaning journey is just to batch cook batch cook batch cook you know get yourself you know two two dozen you know muffin holders from lakeland or whatever and just make some veggie muffins or whatever because i i quite i love you know grating up three or four courgettes or carrots and putting them into some muffins giving them to my kid 
and he's eating it happily away, and I'm kind of doing the maths and going, oh, there's, there's half a carrot in that muffin that you've just eaten. Brilliant. You would never eat just half a carrot. So um, I think t taking, yeah, taking recipes, piling veg into it, putting all of them in the freezer, um, especially now that you know we're getting into spring and summer, so that when you're going on a day out, you just take them out of the freezer in the morning, and by lunchtime it's all ready. Um, that's probably the, the best piece of advice I could give. Yeah, I think um, you reminded me then, we used to make pinwheels um, and that, that, that would go in the oven and a little bit, like you said there, that you could just sneak in um, the extra veg and just see how um, your little one responds to it. So yeah, that's, that's a great tip. So in terms of closing out, I want to just ask you three questions, if that's okay. So um, the first one is, knowing what you know now, what parenting advice would you give yourself before you became a parent? I actually saw a, a quote a few days ago that really, really resonated with me. And it was, your child hitting their milestones is not a reflection on your parenting ability. And that really, really stuck with me. Um, because, you know, you think everyone compares all of their children to everyone else all the time. Even, you know, my kid's got one book from school to read, he's got two or whatever. What they do they do in their own time and it is in no way a reflection on your positives and negatives as a parent yeah and, and that works right from newborn days right through to now as the, the kids are growing older um certainly for us with luca in school you just need to take a step back and obviously encourage them and support their learning and their development but every child is different and they're all going to develop at their own pace what's the one thing you feel you need to work on as a parent um, taking deep breaths. I, I, I think um, every now and then we realise that through our own choice, but we have three very young, emotional boys, age five years and under, um, and it's a lot, and it's intense for us, for me and my wife, and we all need to remember that, you know, it, it's that there's a lot to do, um, and they're just behaving as they should be behaving. Um, and it was our choice to have, uh, you know, three children in, in short periods, and so that the sleep deprivation and everything will pass. Take those deep breaths, and and yeah, just be more present. Yeah, well, hats off to you, because like I said before, Luca was four and a half when Mia was born, so I feel like he was that much more developed. You know, he was he's happy to get involved with things. Um, so we didn't have there was obviously a transition period, but you know he's he's very hands-on with me and he's helping us out a lot which is cool but the idea of three boys under five and under is uh sounds intense just listening <laughs> you do you have a, a good support network around you or is it just you and your wife pairing through yeah so your wife no we, we um not so much family but kind of the, the the town that we moved to is very you know a lot of people move there and have children and have a good couple of children so um yeah especially now that my eldest is going to school everyone's friends with the same sorts of people so yeah there's a good support network okay and then to close off what uh, for you is the best thing about being a parent just hearing your kids call you daddy and i, I it's okay I, I i can't get more deeper than that i think it's just the feeling of that you've created these wonderful things and they need you and and they love you for all of your faults and and every day we should just always try to remember that how they see us and, and, and be the people that they think we are. Yeah, I think when you have that realisation that... Because in my head, I feel maybe in my mid-twenties, like you, you always feel in your head you're a lot younger than you are because I'm mid-thirties now. Um, so, yeah, just knowing... Even as a parent, you don't realise that there's a little child here completely reliant on you, completely dependent on you. You're their role model. You're their guide through their life. So sometimes you just check yourself don't you and think oh wow i'm a dad <laughs> yeah, exactly and and that's by far the most important description of yourself more than anything else is that you're a dad okay well thank you for um joining me today adam i think it was really important i wanted to get you on because i think it's so rare to have a dad so passionate about food and the way you communicate your message is such a positive in, in such a positive way i think needs to be um shown to more and more people so I, I wish you all the best with the book and um we'll definitely chat soon cheers cool thank you tom cool. thanks adam